So I wrote a long list of questions to make sure I kept myself on task because <laughs> I know that I have this um, uh, this tendency to gush. Uh, and I, I don't want to spend the, our whole conversation gushing and telling you that I think you're wonderful. You know I think you're wonderful. Let's talk about your new wonderful book, Angel Thieves. Okay. Um, so if you would just give esteemed audience kind of uh, uh, a brief summary of, of what Angel Thieves is available now, uh, wherever fine books are sold. Uh, what is Angel Thieves uh, all about? Well, it's it's got two major storylines. Um, there's one in what I call real time, which is current day, you know, today. Um, and then there's a another story that, that I called dream time. So there's the current time and then there's the real time, current time, and then there's the dream time, which is the, the older story. And um, they're, they're both set along the Buffalo Bio, which is the main artery, the main water waterway in Houston, which is where I grew up, and Buffalo Bio. And um, so the real time story is about a boy and his father who um, are engaged in the nefarious a trade of stealing graveyard angels and they do it for the black market and they do it, you know, as it's not like an everyday thing that they do, but they do it to, um, you know, to get by, to, to subsidize their income. And, um, and so, uh, so that's the, that's the real time story, the main premise of the real time story. And then there is a, in the in the older story it's set in pre-civil war houston and it's it's about a slave a woman who was enslaved and when her master died he set her free but he did not set her children free and so she's doing the only thing she knows to do and that is grab her little daughters she has two little daughters and um and run to to escape and um and part of I mean, there's there are a number of reasons that I wrote I wrote this that older story, and one of them is that I have a relative. I mean, my my ancestors came to Houston right from the beginning. It was it was Houston was not established until 1836, and so it's a relatively young city as as far as that goes. I mean, there were people there, of course, before before the Allen brothers moved in, but um, they were the the original uh, settlers, but um, so I really wanted to know, you know, it's really, I wanted to find out what, what it was like for my own relatives to be there um, in the 1830s before the Civil War. And, and, and when Texas was actually a country, it was a republic, it wasn't part of the United States yet. So, um, so there, there was that. And then on the real time side of it, I had this experience of going to a funeral with my grandmother and she was one of seven children. And, um, and it was, it was a graveside service. It was for her brother. And it was held at this old, old cemetery in Houston called the Washington cemetery. And I have lots of relatives buried there. So it was a cold rainy day. And as we were driving out, um, <laughs> Um, I kept I kept looking around at the monuments and and I realized something was really off. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, and so I asked my grandmother if we could drive back through. And she was like, "Sure, sure." So we drove back through, and I real what I realized is that all of the angels had their heads cut off. I mean, they were all decapitated, and um, and it was such a freakish you know, experience. I, I, I looked, every angel that I saw at any rate was headless. And so it was so unsettling that a few weeks later, I asked my husband to go down to Houston. He was a photographer at the time and take photos of the angels without their heads. And, and that experience led me to investigate the black market in stolen cemetery statuary. And you know, uh, grave robbing has been around. Some some people say it's the second oldest profession, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, for forever. So so it's not like it's uncommon, but it was. So I just you know I kept thinking, what would it be like, you know, to live that life? But the the thing that really um, the real that made me really wonder about it is that 
is that here in Texas, and I know in Indiana too, um, religion is just a part of the fabric of life here. And, um, and, and so I asked the question, what would it be like if a boy with a really big secret started falling for a girl who is very tied to her church, very religious, very open, very, faith, you know, very sweet in her faith. I, and, and because I know these kids, they're, they're all around, you know, they're, they're, I call them sweet believers because that's just the way they roll. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're shaped, their worldview is shaped by their beliefs, by their religion. And so, so I thought that could be an interesting, you know, an interesting possibility to have a, to have a, a you know, a, a fledgling romance when there's this huge secret um, that it has to come out eventually, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's kind of, that's a little bit of the backstory. So there's the two, you know, the twin stories going back and forth. So, yeah. There's a lot of metaphors about who, who are the actual angels and who, who are the ones that are uh, uh, doing the thieving. Exactly, because Axa, um, she's the slave, the woman who was enslaved. I named her Axa, and um, I, had, I had a great, great grandmother named Axa. So I gave her that name, and I love that name. Um, so yeah, she's taken her daughters, and at that time in Texas, it was it, she would be considered a pirate, you know, to to take her very own daughters and run, even though she was free. She was essentially stealing her baby daughters, and for that, you know, she could suffer the death penalty in Texas at that time. So so that was the question, you know, who's who's the thief? Who's who are the angels? So yeah, so I you know I I toyed with that that question throughout the whole writing of the story. Yeah. yeah. I've got so many questions for you about the book. I uh, uh, finished it early this morning. Um, and, and last night I was I was crying a little bit and I said, this yeah. time, Kat, Kathy Apple's not gonna get me. <laughs> I cried previously, but not this time, nope. Oh. <laughs> so steal yourselves, oh. Uh, oh. esteemed audience, when you go out and you get yourself a copy of Angel Thieves, uh, you will laugh. There are plenty of, of, of wonderful and, and, and fun moments throughout the story, uh, but you, you're probably also going to maybe bust a tear a little bit, or, or, or you're not human, and, and you should have your subject. <laughs> One of those two things. So a question I have for you uh, specifically about Angel Thieves uh, is you said that you had originally written that draft in about six weeks, uh, mm -hmm. but then it took three years before the book was 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 ready and uh, and, 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 and ready to be published, right? right. So my, my first question is what, uh, what happened between those six weeks and the rest of the time before the book was ready? <laughs> okay, that was a lot of weeks, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I, I did the math, it was 150 weeks uh, was, the, was the difference. Oh man, it seems longer than that to me. <laughs> um, you're right, I mean, the book came to me very quickly and I think largely because I had been, I had been toying with these ideas for a long time. It's not like I had just like one morning woke up and and thought, what would it be like, you know, to steal graveyard angels? Because I, I mean, that was something that ha the original moment with my grandmother happened back in the 90s. So I've been kind of carrying that notion around with me for a while. So and and the same with um, AXA because I had read a. An, a tiny article online about a woman in Houston named Sylvia Roth who had that experience. She was a slave and when her master died, he set her free, but he put their, their children in custody or guardianship of a fellow slaveholder. And so that was largely based on a real, a real story. So it's like, you know, I had these kind of stories going back and forth in my head already. So the, the initial draft was was pretty quick, you know. I read, I wrote it pretty quick, and it was, it was, it was short. You know, it, it really was a, a working draft. You know, I can't say that it was complete by any stretch of the imagination. But then a number of things had to happen. You know, I really had to do quite a bit of research to, you know, to be able to set the novel correctly in time. Um, you know, it it, it did. The backstory happened in the 
in, in, in 1846 was just before Texas joined the union. And, um, and so I needed to make sure that my dates were working, um, especially in conjunction with the Trail of Tears. So they were almost a little concurrent. The, the Texas War for Independence against Mexico and the Trail of Tears happened pretty much at the same time. So, um, so I need to be sure that was all in place. But the other thing that I absolutely had to do was get readers. You know, I because I was writing outside of my lane. You know, I had a an African American uh, slave as a as a primary character, and so I, you know, I had to I had to hire a or I I just needed to hire a um, professional reader for that for that story to make sure that I was not um you know counting on stereotypes or misportraying um you know who she was and all of that so and same with i have i have a native american character in the book as well and so i hired a um, um a professional reader for that character too for the native american and, and you know it's not as easy as just saying oh well i I can just hire a Native American. No, I, you know, I needed to find somebody who was in that nation, the Cherokee nation, um, or I felt that I did. You know, I had, I really, I really wanted to take care with this novel to be sure that, you know, that that I was um, not misrepresenting anybody or per perpetrating, uh, per perpetuating a stereotype or something like that. And so it was really, really important to me to get that right. And um, um, so, so, and, and also I had to, I had to have a reader for the theology of the book, because even though it's not, you know, I don't really get into theological issues in a major way with the book, I still have this character who is deeply grounded in her religion and the church too. The church itself is like a character. And so I had to be sure that, you know, that that also was in place. And so it was just a lot of, first of all, expanding the story, you know, in a way that it could accommodate the various storylines, but also just, you know, taking care with them to be sure that, um, you know, that I was being careful and that I was being astute and being um, humble in the face of, um the characters that you know that are not in my you know my own um, background or or you know milieu so um so so you know i i think it was important to let the story unfold in its own time um and it's not like i worked on it every single day but but i have to say the story taught me a lot you know i i i was surprised at some of my own um, assumptions that were that I was mistaken about and and so so I just wanted to be sure that I took care and so I and, and as a result it just it just took another 150 weeks and honestly if I had two more weeks I'd probably change some of it <laughs> of <course. laughs> my editor was like Kathy let go it's like we were tugging on it you know she's like let Go! We've got to get this. We've got to get this thing to the printer. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But that's true of all of my books. You know, I read them and I'm like, oh man, I'd like to go in and change that. <laughs> I'm sure you have that experience too. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. I I, I uh, try not to read my old books. Um, right. <laughs> just because I'll I'll, I'll want to go through them well, now. I know more. <laughs> let me let me change this. Um, right. Right. Exactly. 